Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host over here, uh, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, we're a webcast, um, an online show. There's some uh, disagreement on what to call these things. Um, but we don't care what you call us, but we're here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Call us what you want, but um, come and watch. <laughs> Um, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, you can always watch our recordings. We do record every week, so you can go on our website and see all of that. Um, both our live show and our recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So definitely you know, share the information with your colleagues out there. Um, we do a mixture of things here on the show, presentations, uh, book reviews, interviews, um, mini training sessions, demos, which is pretty much what we're doing today. I believe. <laughs> Um, we bring in guest speakers sometimes, but sometimes we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff, which is what we have today, a whole group. Um, today we have Deborah Dragos and Susan Nisley and Alana Nabati, all in order there, from, um, well, Technology and Access <laughs> Services Department, <I'm> trying, <laughs> and at the Library already. Commission. I'm here still. <laughs> um, who are our key um, people in charge of Nebraska Access, our database, group of databases that we have. And apparently there's a ton of changes coming. And they're going to tell us everything you want to know about all the things that are happening in one hour. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever or it takes. <laughs> whatever we can get into yeah. one hour. Yeah. So I will hand over the mouse to you guys. Okay. You can do. You go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Krista. Um, as Krista said, and if you read the description for the session today, we are going to be talking about 13 new databases that we are going to be subscribing to from EBSCO. But I thought I'd start off this morning with just some information about Nebraska Access. The Nebraska Library Commission requested and received funding for statewide subscription to informational databases and started offering them through Nebraska Access in 1999. Since then, the databases of offerings have changed very little, as we have not been able to increase the funding to subscribe to additional databases or to expand access for the ProQuest eLibrary database to the K-12 schools. We have asked for additional funding in our budget multiple times to extend access for eLibrary, but we have not been successful in that. And in fact, in 2010, because of state budget cuts, we did have to drop the Kiplinger database and we negotiated either flat or even one highly reduced renewal pricing for the other databases that are in Nebraska Access. Over the years, librarians have asked for K-8 content, they've asked for novelist, small business information, and other content. So when the EBSCO representatives approached us earlier this year with a proposal to bundle 13 databases, which would be available to all types of libraries, at a price that is less than we are currently paying for five of the databases, which includes the e-library, that has the restricted access, we had to give it really serious consideration. Not only will this bundle save the commission money, but it also saves money for libraries who are subscribing to some of these databases, and it helps out those libraries that cannot afford to subscribe to these databases. The content of the EBSCO general interest databases, the genealogy database, and novelist does overlap with databases that will be dropped this coming year, but there's a lot of new content too. The databases that will not be available after July 1st are Heritage Quest Online, which is, if I can move the screen here, which is our genealogy database, but there is a replacement genealogy database, eLibrary, the Omnifile Full Text Select, and Books in Print. The Biography Reference Bank will still be available. It is an EBSCO product and it will, we are told, eventually combine with the Biography Reference Center, which will also be available to you now. Uh, WorldCat and First Search will also be available after July 1st. The 13 EBSCO databases that will be live for all the Nebraska residents to access from any library, school, 
work, or home on July 1st will be available through this same URL. This page will just totally change and we'll show you what that will look like here in just a couple minutes. The same Nebraska Access passwords that you are currently using will still work as will your IP addresses, Nebraska driver's licenses, and state IDs. Okay. Access for library staff will be available later today so that you have a chance to look over these databases. An email will be sent out over the Nebraska Access, the systems, and the trial mailing lists to provide you with a temporary web link and a unique password. Okay. This site is meant only to be available to library staff, not the public. So please do not post this on your website or hand it out to your customers. Okay. We will also be putting up a customizable press release announcing that the debt that um, announcing the new databases, sorry, um, and that will be placed on the librarian's toolbox within the Library Commission's website. Okay. Susan is currently working on setting up database roadshow trainings around the state. She has two set up right now for later in August and she's working on others. There will also be recorded webinars about each of the databases and so those will be um, available live or to watch through recordings at a later date. So watch for emails announcing times and places for those training sessions. On another note, before we get into the EBSCO databases, you may have heard that OCLC is transitioning from the first search interface, which includes the WorldCat database. Their new interface is called WorldCat Discovery Service. The Commission will make a change to this new interface later this fall. Um, there are differences not only in the look of the interface and the, the, um, the way it works, but we've had several issues um, as far as access goes that we've had to work through and it has taken some time. Um, as part of that move, Alana will be asking all the schools and libraries for updated IP information. So um, if you get that email, please let us know so that we make sure our information is up to date. This relates to the fact that each library that does OCLC cataloging and or interlibrary loan has been assigned a unique URL for access to this WorldCat Discovery Service by OCLC, okay? So if your library has static IP addresses, but you still send your patrons through the Nebraska, and Alana's frowning at me. <laughs> and we've gone back, and I'll tell you, we've gone back and forth with OCLC and between ourselves so often on the authentication process that it's gotten very confusing. Yeah. So we just still want an updated IP. We That's want the main, updated IP. That was ever set as so, crack. We do want them. So I'll just say the setup can be rather complex. So we'll be talking to you, those in a library loan and cataloging libraries, possibly individually or as, as just the subset of all the libraries at a later time to get that all of that straightened out. Okay. So Back to the new EBSCO databases and the preview site. Oops, did you? We have that bookmark. Okay, we'll go here. Okay. Make it full screen. Yeah. If you need to. This is the website that you will be sent to, and I'm not going to tell you what the password is. You'll get that in the email. But once you go Say in, yes, remember, please. Once you go in, you'll see that we actually have now laid out the web page in two sections. At the top, we have databases that can be used by anyone, could be of interest to anyone. And then towards the bottom, we have highlighted those databases that are could be especially useful to the K-12 population, but that doesn't mean that 
only students may use them. All of these are available to everybody. So I am going to turn this over to Susan and Alana, and they are going to do overviews of each of the databases. I assume you didn't have any questions yet, Krista? No. Okay. No, we're good. <laughs> well, as Deborah said, this is Alana. Um, and Susan and I are going to fairly quickly just kind of highlight what is in each of these resources. Um, with our limited amount of time, we're only going to spend a couple minutes, so this is definitely not a training session or anything like that. We just kind of want to give you a preview of what's available. Um, and we're kind of, kind of going to skip around a little bit here in the order. Uh, the first database I want to actually start talking about is the master file. Um, before jumping into that, I also want to point out you will see these question marks on the page. These will take you to the about or help information. And I wanted to point these out because we do include on these pages links to the title lists. Um, I always find it useful to go into a title list to see what journals, magazines, and other resources are included in a database. And as we move forward and develop more training material, we're also going to um, probably have more um, help information available at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but Susan and I are still working on that, so it'll be a few weeks before that probably comes about. So I'm going to jump back, and I'm going to go ahead and get into the master file. Um, the master file is one of the more general databases in the collection. If your go-to database before was the Omni file, I would suggest the master file would be the, um, uh, the database you want to start using to start with. Uh, the master file contains more than 2,200 full text magazines and journals um, covering a variety of topics. Um, as I mentioned, it's a great database for general research um, for adults and students. Uh, in addition to the journals and magazines, there's also 1,000 reference books and 55,000 primary source documents. So it's a wide variety of information. Uh, I also wanted to point out that those, when we're starting talking about the journals and magazines, the coverage of them you know, will vary from title to title, but there are a couple of um, titles that actually go back to 1923. Um, for example, the Saturday Evening Post goes back to Coverage goes back to 1931, and that is available as PDFs. So I pulled up a few of those. It's kind of fun to look at the covers of those magazines. Um, Time also goes back to 1923. I think those could wow. be good resources if you're studying something from a time period to go back and see how that you know issue was covered during that time period in those periodicals. Um, some other great Journals and magazines that are included in the database are going to be consumer reports and consumer report buying guides. I'm very excited to have those in there personally because I'm always, you know, we always, yeah, you always have something it seems like to buy, and it's great to be able to go in there and see, you know, what their reviews are and recommendations are. So I think a lot of people across the state will get a lot of use out of those magazines and the buying guide. Otherwise, you need to subscribe yourself personally to Consumer Reports, which... Or go to the, um, go and get the paper copy at the right. library. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm really excited about those. Um, there are a lot of other journals and more academic titles in there, too, but I also wanted to highlight some of the time content um, that, for those of you who've been around long enough, you may remember we lost some of the time content from the Wilson databases. I didn't look up the exact date of it, but it's been a few years ago. But um, now we will have access to journals such as Sports Illustrated, uh, Cooking Light, People, Field and Stream, Country Living. So um, don't think of these just as all hardcore research titles in here, but there's also some more um, general purpose magazines that you could be of use. So I'm going to go ahead and just do just one quick search in here. Oops. So I just went ahead and did a search for digital camera. Um, it, looking at this interface, I'm sure most people recognize it. This looks just like the interface we had for the Omni file and the biographies database. So you should be used to the data, the interface. Um, the first one here I just wanted to point out is digital camera basics, and this is one of those consumer report buying guides. And I'm just going to jump right into the PDF of this document. 
just to show you that it looks just like you would get if you were looking at the regular paper version of the Consumer Reports with your little nice handy charts. One other thing I did want to point out um, about the master file, um, this database actually contains full text and it also has just some abstracts and indexing. Um, so if you do want to limit your search to full text, there is a nice limit here over on the left hand side that will easily allow you to limit your search results to just the full text. Those of you who went to roadshows in the past will remember Alana and I complaining about um, <laughs> the full text limiter when our database was 100% full text. Now, finally, <laughs> it has a purpose, has in, our a purpose in our lives. <laughs> so that, I know that was a real quick overview, but I need to keep moving so I give Susan enough time to talk about the other databases. Um, there's a couple of ways we can go back and forth um, to select different databases. You can see here I just clicked on the choose database option. Um, I could choose a different database here or of course I can go back to the uh, preview site. The next database I want to jump into, I'm going to scroll down here to the databases especially for K-12s and I'm going to go to the search primary. So the primary search is designed specifically for elementary age students. Um, it has full text and articles from 70 popular, popular elementary school magazines. Um, some of those magazines include things such as Boys Life, National Geographic Kids, Ranger Rick, um, Time for Kids, and Sports Illustrated for Kids. Now also included in this database is the Funk and Wagnalls New World Encyclopedia, which I'm sure a lot of school folks will be happy to see. Um, there's also the Encyclopedia of Animals and then there and the American Heritage Children's Dictionary. So let me just show you a quick search here. Uh, Nebraska, I know that's not a very exciting search, but I did want to point out again, I'm going to limit it to full text. Over here on the right, there's source types. And I just want to point out that there are different source types available in this database. So it's easy to go, maybe if you want to see some of the primary source documents. So you can see now we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Lincoln-Douglas Lincoln debates. So that could be useful. And the other search I wanted to do, I was talking with my nephew last night and he was doing something with Minecraft. Um, so I just wanted to point this one out because I thought librarians who are maybe doing story hour or working for things with kids also could find this useful because the first article that I pulled up was you can make some Minecraft ornaments. So uh, just keep that in mind too. Don't think of it as just a children's resource. Adults who work with children may also find it useful. That's a little bit fun to make. They do, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and jump back again to the preview. And I'm not going to take the time to get into it, but right now we do have a link right here for the Funk and Wagnall a New World Encyclopedia. So if you have students that want to jump right into the encyclopedia and just search that, um, you can obviously do that by clicking that button and following the link. I'm going to go ahead then and scroll back up the screen here. And the next two databases I want to talk about are going to be the Psychology and Behavioral Science Collection and the Science and Technology Collection. Um, these two databases are also going to be in that same um, EBSCO interface. Uh, the, I'm in right now, I'm on the Psychology and Behavioral Science Collection. Um, this one offers a full, cover, a full text coverage of a broad range of subjects in the field of psychology, behavioral sciences, and related discipline. There are, <clears throat> excuse me, more than uh, 530 scholarly journals with an extensive back file included in here. Now, at first, just hearing that, that name, Psychology and Behavioral Science, you may think, now, okay, now, how would I use that? 
And actually, the more I think about it, the more uses I have for this database. Um, obviously, if you have students in high school or college who are taking those site classes, um, they may need to do some research. But there's also maybe community members or even teachers in the school system or counselors that um, could benefit from research in this database. And also think about parents who maybe have um, their children has been you know, diagnosed with having ADHD or dyslexia or things like that. And you know, they want to do more research about um, those particular topics. This is a great resource to go to. Um, I didn't recognize a lot of the titles in the list, but a couple that stood out to me were there's the um, elementary school guidance and counseling is one of the titles in there. And there's also one about professional school counseling. So I think those both could be helpful. I'm going to go ahead and do a search on bullying in schools. Again, you can see I got a number of results. And now, again, this is a mixture of um, resources that are available in full text and some that are just abstracts and indexing. And again, there is that full text limiter. So if that's important to you. I'm just going to go ahead and use this Choose Database link right now. I'm going to go ahead and uncheck Psychology. And I'm going to jump right into Science and Technology Collection. So the Science and... Well, let me get rid of that search here. No. Um, Science and Technology Collection, it has the full text from over 830 leading scholarly journals um, and covers many uh, scientific and technology subject areas, including things like arc, um, aviation, biology, chemistry, computer technology. Uh, so I was thinking about those topics, and again, I thought, oh, now what do I want to know about those? But one thing that's in the news way too much lately a drone, whoops, are drones. Uh, if I could type drones, maybe, I don't know. That's why they have the suggestions for you. In case you yeah. Have. I think I should have had Dever drive for me. <laughs> so you can see here now um, who controls drones. Here's just a full text story about them. So I really do think um, this database will get a lot of use. Like I said, don't be kind of scared off by that, that title of science. Uh, I'm going to jump back to the preview page here again. And I am not going to jump into it, but again, Deborah had mentioned the biography uh, reference bank. That is one of the database we currently have, and the link is here, and it will take us just the same interface we have now. And then the last database I want to point out before uh, turning things over to Susan is MyHeritage. And this is the genealogy resource that is available now from EBSCO. And I have to say, trying to talk about this database in three or four minutes, I think is impossible because mm -hmm. there's just so much cool stuff in it. I don't know where to begin. Um, they have more than 5 billion historical records from 48 countries. And that's a billion if, with a B. That's a billion <laughs> with a B and 48 cool. countries. So mm -hmm. the genealogy resources we have and that have had access to in the past really have focused on the United States. Mm -hmm. So this really is international. Um, like a lot of the genealogy products that are offered to libraries, MyHeritage, we have the MyHeritage Library Edition. Um, they also have a version that the public can buy for themselves, buy access to for themselves at home. Mm -hmm. um, and in that edition, a lot of users can make family trees. And so this, the library edition will actually search those family trees. So I was searching for Novotny, which is a Czech name, if you didn't know that. And um, I was coming up with family trees that were in 
Czechoslovakian because they were done by people who live in Czechoslovakia. You know, wow. so um, you could make out the names. I, I can't read Czech very well, but I mean, just so that really showed you, shows, uh, showed me just how international the coverage of this database is. So I'm really not going to try to find any one person here. I just want to show you a few things in the interface. So I'll search for John Novotny. Um, you may want to check out the advanced search screen just because it kind of lets you control how the matching is exactly or not exactly. That's something more we'll cover when, when training information. But So doing a search off this main screen is really just casting a very wide net. It's going to get you something from everything. So you can see over here on the left-hand side, it tells me how many hits I'm getting in the census and the birth records and photos, and it goes on and on. Um, you can also just have a nice summary that kind of groups them together. Um, this I didn't mention it yet, but it does include the U.S. federal census like we've had access to in the before in the past, so that's all there. Um, what I find helpful to do in this database is I'm going to jump back to the main screen here. And it's not quite clear, but you can see over here there are these 14 categories along the side. So if I want to look at census information, I can click on it. And now I'm, I'm searching across all census. And you can see them listed here. And you can see one of them here is actually the UK census. And again, all of these are links that I can click on, and this will just narrow down what I'm searching in. But the other thing I find useful is up here, these descriptions. It will tell you exactly what these items are because looking at some of them by name, I had no clue what they really were and what I was mm -hmm. searching. So, Especially the international things we've never had access to. Yes, before. I, yeah. yeah. So um, going back here, there are other interesting things that I found. Um, birth, marriage, and you know, death records. So there's England, births and uh, christenings. So let me jump back a little more. Under immigration and travel, I wanted to point out that there are some passenger lists, which could be helpful. So From again, 1500 to 1900. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you know, this one, they go on to tell you how, how it's organized, where the information come from. So I, I, said, I just wanted to point that out because I think it's easy to miss that information. I think that really will help the genealogists out there um, kind of navigate this. And the other thing I did want to mention, uh, like I said, I'm not going to be able to cover all these here, but don't limit your thoughts to this only being useful for genealogists. This also could be useful in schools if the students are studying people, historical people. Um, I know I've been able to look up some of the first governor of Nebraska in here and find him in different places. So it, it has a lot of wide possibilities if you just kind of go past the genealogy aspect of it. So. So those were the databases I wanted to cover um, first here. I wanted to turn it, I'm going to turn it over to Susan now and let her carry on here with some more. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and this might be dangerous, but I'm going to start with Novelist Plus and Novelist K8 Plus because I really like them. They're my favorite databases. And it's probably uh, my... Uh, What's dangerous is I could probably talk about them too long. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with them, though, because I like them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go into Novelist Plus first. And I will just say, um, just to give you background information on Novelist Plus, it is really marketed as a reader's advisory tool. It covers fiction and nonfiction for all ages and grades. And I will say this about the nonfiction. The nonfiction is nonfiction that appeals to readers reading for pleasure. So that means things like biographies or narrative nonfiction. Um, you're not going to get things like um, textbooks or 
uh, knitting for dummies or cookbooks, things like that in here. So that's one way to think about um, the type of nonfiction that's included, nonfiction that people read for pleasure. I think this is a database that's going to be really useful to us as librarians who have to do reader's advisory service. And also, I think your patrons who really love books and love to read would really love this database too. You can really get lost in it, following links and getting ideas for what to read next. Um, Novelist Plus was also recently updated with audiobook recommendations, so those of you who have patrons who really love audiobooks um, can highlight that to them. Novelist K8 Plus, as far as I can tell, it truly is a subset of Novelist Plus, meaning that everything that's in Novelist K8 Plus is also in Novelist Plus. The value of the Novelist K8 Plus is that you can uh, use it for students and they will not then have to wade through all of the uh, adult content as well. Uh, one thing about Novelist K8 Plus is there is not audio but book coverage in that particular database yet. So um, the other thing I want to mention about this database is there's lots of uh, Obviously, you can find information about books in this database, but there's lots of proprietary content that was written just for this database that is designed to help you with reader's advisory. So I'll try to point out that as we go along also. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start out and just do a search for a book. And I'm going to do a book that I know isn't a series. So this is going to be a good way, I think, for us to see what kind of information you can get in this database. So I'm going to do Bangkok 8. And this is the uh, uh, record for this book. And you will see you've got author. It's an adult fiction title that is, uh, looks like it's uh, an award winner. If a book is in a series, it will tell you that it's in a series and which place it is in the series. If I click on this link, it will take me to a series record that will list all the titles in the series in series order. Uh, you will usually have a description or synopsis of the plot of the book, so that's helpful if patrons are trying to get an idea if it's interesting to them. Or if they've read it before. Or maybe <laughs> I might remind them if they've read it before, true. Um, and then this is something else that's fairly unique to novelists. They use something called appeal terms to help them determine or help them recommend titles to patrons or help patrons find additional titles that they might like to read. Um, appeal terms go beyond things like subject matter or genre of the book. So um, it try, the, the, the appeal terms try to tease out what it is about the book that really made you like it. Um, you could have books on the same subject, but they're not going to necessarily appeal to a patron. And I'm going to go ahead and just click here quickly. And I, I would encourage you all to take a look at this screen at some point. Um, this describes appeal terms, and then I'm going to go to the appeals, appeal terms page. And this shows you all the kind of characteristics that you can use to search for books or that they assign to books to describe the sort of... Um, flavor of the book. So all of these different types of terms to uh, assign to the characters in the book. There's even snarky or uh, <laughs> relatable, spirited. Um, Twisted. Yeah, <laughs> information about storyline, pace. Do you want fast paced? Do you want leisurely paced? Um, tone, bittersweet, body, angst filled. You can see these are not really describing the subject matter of the book or the genre, but other characteristics mm -hmm. that determine maybe why a patron liked a particular book. So I would really encourage you to take a look at those terms later, and you'll see how they're used throughout. Um, so here again, you've got, these are the appeal terms that have been assigned to this book and the genre. So it's a mystery story, it's intricately plotted, plot-driven, fast-paced, funny, strong sense of place, suspenseful, etc. Writing style, gritty. So scrolling down, you've got reviews from, th from four different review sources here. And then at the bottom of the page, again, you've got um, different uh, characteristics and terms that you can check if you want to perform a search for other titles that share the same characteristics. So you can pick among the subject, 
the uh, genres, the appeal turns. Um, going up again, I want to point out to the right, you've got read-alikes. And if you hover over them, it will tell you a little bit about the recommendation. And it will tell you why it is considered a potential read-alike. In this particular case, this recommendation was made by a human. And so it will tell you the name of the human that made this recommendation. And it will tell you why it's similar. Um, these thrillers feature exotic settings, taut suspense, and unusual main characters, etc. So you'll understand why. Why is this similar? And is that the similar? Is that the part of the book that really appealed to me? Um, here's another one that I think has a, a human-written reason for why it's related. Um, Going down here, some of these are generated automatically using algorithms that I'm sure use those appeal terms. In this particular case, you'll see the reason. Um, novelist recommends this. Uh, let's see. That was not as good of an example, but some of these will tell you what appeal terms they have in common. Um, and I'm like striking out here. Here we go. Um, these books are suspenseful, plot-driven, fast-paced, they share the genre mystery stories and the subject murder investigation. I think that's still auto-generated, um, not created by a person, but it tells you why they're similar. One really nice uh, feature if you're helping a patron is you have this view all option. You can click on it and you have a list of all the uh, suggested read-alikes along with the reason they're suggested and you can easily print it off and hand it to the patron and they can um, take it away with them. Um, also for each book, uh, in some, not in all cases, but some cases you'll get a link to first chapter and there will also be a link to Goodreads, uh, which many of you might be familiar with um, a site that you as, a, any, as an end user can create an account with and you'll get reviews from um, readers. Uh, they're not professional re reviews but they can still give you a good idea of whether it's a book that might interest you. So I think that's a plus. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back home now and I Obviously, you can see lots of additional links around here that you can click on. Um, you've got recommended reading lists, and just notice that uh, you can specify fiction, adult, teens, ages 9 through 12, ages 0 through 8, or nonfiction, and things aren't showing up. <laughs> um, and this is something that I really want to point out. The internet's a little slow at the moment. <sighs> Well, I would recommend that you click on all these links and see what's there. Um, lists and articles, um, Spotlight On, this is where you get some of that proprietary content that's written by um, staff, EBSCO staff members who are assigned specifically to novelists. They also contract with um, people in the profession who are known as uh, for their reader's advisory um, specialization. Um, under Spotlight, one of the things that I really, really like is um, they have information about different genres and they will, for, for um, they list more genres than you would ever think existed. Um, for example, for thrillers and suspense, you get a page that has all kinds of information about this genre. Why do people read it? Um, who are some of the most uh, well-known authors in this genre? What are some recommended titles in this genre? So um, that can be really useful. Um, let me go ahead now. Let's try. Um, there's just one thing I'm going to show you in Novelist K8. Uh, as you can see, it looks very similar to um, the uh, regular Novelist. And I just want to point out here, it defaults to ages 9 through 12. I'm going to go ahead and go to teen. This is one of those things that I just think is um, a neat characteristic. For example, under here, it says for fans of. You click on that. And here they have even like television, like musical groups and television series. And they say, if you have student, if you have, uh, you know, kids who like One Direction, these might be books they'd like. Or if you like kids who like um, games, Game of Thrones, um, here are books that we'd recommend for them. So that's a whole different way of doing readers' advisory. So um, that's what I like about this database. 
Okay. Hopefully that's the uh, database that I will spend the most time on. <laughs> um, biography Reference Center is the other biography database that we have access to. Um, it has uh, close to half a million, uh, let's see, a half a million full text biographies. Uh, it's got content from Biography Today and Biography Magazine. Uh, there are several ways you can find the content. You can do a basic search by um, the name of a person, an occupation, a country, or nationality. They have a nice uh, carousel with images um, of people whose biographies they're uh, featuring. So you can click on one of those images to get a biography. I'm going to go ahead and just click on Steve Jobs' image just to get you to a basic record. This is what they call their biography landing page, and each individual will have one. It's got some basic information about the person. Down below, you'll see a section on detailed biographies. So I can go ahead and um, access the full text for one of these biographical articles. In this case, it's nice and lengthy. And then also there will be a section with more concise biographies. These would be maybe biographical entries in a biographical uh, reference book where you might expect just a, you know, half a page or something. Okay, going back, I want to do a quick search to show you how the search works. I did a search on Patrick Stewart. In this case, um, if I clicked on this record, I would get to the biography landing page, which is the type of page we landed on with Steve Jobs. Over at the left, I have some other options, however. Again, I could go to those detailed biographies listing, the concise biographies listing. I also have um, a link that says interviews, and you'll see now I've got um, biographical articles from a number of different magazines and journals that I could access about Patrick Stewart. So that is some su supplemental material. Uh, I do want to point out the advanced search screen. This is a screen where you can kind of build a search to, to describe the type of person you're interested in uh, without necessarily knowing the name of the person. So I could say, um, I want uh, I want Canadian. Canadian female authors. And I swear some of these uh, limiters are wrapping differently and showing up in different spots than they were upstairs, but okay, what did I do wrong? Female. I'm having trouble seeing, so I can't even see if I'm spelling things incorrectly. Okay, yeah. female Canadian author. So now I've got a list of 77 um, female Canadian authors. So that's the way you can use that. Moving along. Um, Another one of my favorite databases in the new package is Points of View Reference Center. Um, I think it would be of interest to anybody, but realistically it's probably going to be used most by uh, students, um, upper, uh, middle school, and high school. Um, it's going to be a great resource for students who need to uh, study a controversial topic, um, understand both sides of the issue, write a persuasive essay, participate in debates, etc. Um, there are several ways you can search content here. You can type in a search term. They have a carousel where they list uh, controversial topics that are in the news. And they also let you browse by category. So I'm going to go ahead and go down to um, crime and punishment and capital punishment. Uh, there are over 370 topics 
topic areas covered by points of view. And for each topic area, you can expect to get at least an overview essay, which is written specifically for this database. And it's going to give you background information on the issue um, and what, what the history is. Uh, so you'll have a, the background article. Over to the right, then you'll have a link. You'll have a point article and a counterpoint ar article. So one will, um, so these articles or essays will take uh, different sides of the issue and lay out the argument for or against a particular topic. And again, these are written specifically for the, uh, this database. There's also something called um, Guide to Critical Analysis uh, for each topic. And again, it's going to kind of walk students through how to analyze and think about the issue. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is they give the difference between facts and opinions. So they'll make a factual statement and an opinion statement and kind of show how, why uh, one's opinion, one's fact. And these are tied to the issues. Finally, for any particular issue, um, if you look over on the left, uh, in addition to the content that's written specifically for points of view, you also have uh, magazines, newspapers, books, biographies, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and just click on magazines here. And now I will get um, magazine articles on capital punishment um, that would also help support a student writing a persuasive essay or preparing uh, to debate a particular issue. So not only is there unique content in this database, it's a great way to get your students seeing all sides of an issue. Um, getting backup support material for them. So again, I think this would be really useful for schools. Switching uh, gears again. We have um, some what they call their reference centers. So I'm going to start with the Legal Information Reference Center. This is obviously not going to uh, take the place of uh, a patron needing to talk to a lawyer, but at least it will give them background information on what some of the legal issues are uh, that they may be dealing with and ways to think about it. So there are several ways to find information. You can do a search. Uh, you can browse by category. Or you can browse popular sources. And you can see here that uh, in, under the popular sources carousel, they highlight these NOLO guides. Um, this, is not an ex this is not a comprehensive uh, display of sources included, but these are some that they are highlighting. And if a patron clicks on one of these titles, they'll get into a PDF version of the full book. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, do a quick search for overtime. So anyone who has employees might be interested in uh, this issue at some point. So you can see that the results come from the different um, full text guides and handbooks, employers, legal handbook, um, essential guide to federal employment laws, etc., uh, leave and time off. Uh, so. Um, this is one way to get into the full text content. Um, you can also uh, browse by categories and drill down, like I said, um, under family affairs and divorce, for instance. You've got some subcategories, picking parenting. And um, you've got several guides to IEPs. So again, parents who have students who have IEPs in the school system might be interested in these guides. Again, as you open them up. Alana's frowning. IEP is individual, individual education program or, oh. or something like that. So um, you've got uh, the PDF version of the uh, document here. Uh, you can scroll through the chapters on the left in order to access the whole thing. So, um, one individualized education program uh, individualized. personal to that child. Yes. yes. 
Okay, so that is the Legal Information Reference Center. We also have the Small Business Reference Center, which is something that I think would be really easy for public libraries to promote um, in their community for um, community development purposes. Um, again, it's got the option for searching, the option to browse categories or browse popular sources. And again, um, the popular sources that they highlight are those NOLO uh, guides, the full text that are available. Um, Can I throw in one thing? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, before we get too much further. On the Legal Information Center, there's also many, many legal forms from all the states. So if your patrons are looking for legal forms, that, that could be a source also. Okay, um, again, I'll give you examples of how you can search this. You might do a search for crowd, uh, crowdfunding. And one thing I didn't mention with the legal, um, most of the full text content in the Legal Reference Center comes from full text publications. There are a few magazines that are included full text, but not many. Small Business Center is different. There are lots of full text publications and guides like those NOLO guides, but there are also a number of, um, I think over 500 full text magazines and journals that are represented. And so when I do the search for crowdfunding, you can see some of the publications that the articles come from. Food, manufact, I'm sorry, my eyes, and, and, yeah, I can't read the small Starting text. and building a nonprofit. Starting, you know, business mag, you know, Oregon Business Magazine, Business Week, etc. So you can find lots of um, trade publications, um, business uh, magazines, etc. Um, under the uh, Browse by Category, um, I would encourage all of you to explore these categories. I'm going to go ahead and go to Industry Information by Small Business Type. Um, you can go to for something like bakeries and then you have an option you can search for articles and magazines and journals or you can search for industry information so if you've got someone who is wanting to start a business you can see how this would be uh, really useful here's a an industry profile Obviously, this is something that um, business students in a, a college or university class might find interesting also. So you've got all more information than you'd ever want to know about the um, business of bakeries and uh, market overview, etc. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what you can find in this database. Um, it also does include a number of videos from the Harvard Business School. So, um, you know, if you've got people who want to do that sort of sort of professional development, um, watching uh, lectures on things like um, marketing or um, or uh, I can't think. Sorry. <laughs> Um, finally, um, I want to go into is that my last one. Um, health. Health. Sorry. Um, Consumer Health Reference Center. Um, this is obviously aimed at uh, not medical professionals, but your everyday average person who maybe has been diagnosed with a particular condition who, who, who wants to be proactive about their health or understand a diagnosis. Um, on this main screen, you'll see um, these different categories basically represent different types of publications that are included. So evidence-based reports, fact sheets and pamphlets, news and magazines, uh, alternative sources. So it not only standard um, medical uh, health publications, but also more alternative and complementary um, pr procedures and, and um, publications are included as well. Um, these categories, you will see them represented in result lists in the form of uh, tabs that, patron that um, users can click through. So I'm going to go ahead and do a search 
I can remember what my search was. I lost my handout that has that information on it. Here we go. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and do COPD and do a search. And you'll see it looks like I got one result, but basically what it means is I got one result that is in the category of evidence-based reports. Now you'll see tabs representing all those different source types. So I can find encyclopedia articles on COPD, reference books, um, fact sheets, news magazines, etc. And these are all, uh, I believe all of these are full text, so you can uh, find lots of different types of information. Um, you can even find information on what sorts of uh, drugs might be uh, prescribed to someone who has COPD. So. Um, other ways you can find information in this database, uh, you've got a quick find over to the right that lets you search an alphabetical list of diseases, conditions, injuries, etc. So just picking a letter at random, you can see um, a list that you can browse through. If you don't remember how to spell it, but you know what the word starts right. with. <laughs> um, yeah. You've also got a uh, search by topic area. So I could, for instance, say, okay, I'm interested in children's health. It will show me subtopics under children's health. So I could perhaps say teenagers, age 11 through 16. If I check that and then I do a search up here, my search is going to be limited to that subcategory. So I could say something like depression. And my results will uh, be uh, focused on that subcategory. Uh, finally, at the bottom, they do highlight a few uh, sort of popular sources uh, that they include content from. So, for example, Men's Fitness Magazine. Um, they give you, I, I'm not sure, I think this is probably uh, content from the current issue. You can also search within that publication. Um, I imagine this is mainly going to be of interest to people who um, just kind of want to browse periodically and see what the latest in that magazine is. So here's a way that you can do a search for articles about CrossFit that occurred in men's fitness. So um, That's uh, my overview of the databases. And so I think Alana's got two more things that she's going to talk about briefly. I know time is short, so I will make this quick. That's okay. Um, just so let everyone know, we are at 11 o'clock, but we did start about five minutes after. Um, we'll go as long as it takes for them to finish up, and we do have a few questions here as well. Um, so if you do need to leave because you know, your hour allotted for this is done, that's fine. We're recording. You can always watch it later and catch up on the bit you might have missed at the end. Go ahead. I'll still try to make it short. Okay. Um, the last two databases I want to mention are more of what I like to think of interfaces as opposed to data databases, that is the Explorer that you'll see highlighted here across the top, and that's the Explorer for what they EBSCO, uh, EBSCO refers to as public libraries, and Explorer down here, the primary school version of Explorer. I'm going to start with the Explorer primary schools, and what this is, it is an interface that actually brings content together from multiple resources, so in this uh, Explora primary source, you will have access to um, the primary search database that I showed you earlier. Um, that Funk and Wagnall's New, New World Encyclopedia is in here. Um, again, the American Heritage Children's Dictionary. And you also will be searching across Biography, Re uh, Biography Reference Center that Susan showed you earlier. Um, what I really like about these interfaces, however, is the fact that they, as you can see, are much more colorful looking. <laughs> And they let students browse, which I think can also be helpful. You can see here we have um, these main categories. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the animal category. And you can see here um, it's broken down by alphabetical. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at alligator. Uh, you can see here at the top of the screen, the first thing it gives me when I'm in the Explorer interfaces are what they call these topic overviews. Uh, this is from the Salem Press Primary Encyclopedia. So you can see here it gives me a, just you know a lot of basic information on alligators. And 
And I do want to point out, by default, uh, both Explorer interfaces will limit your search results to full text. So that way, um, if you have the, you know, elementary kids in here doing searching, they are going to get those full text results right away. You can see there are other reference books that are coming up here. Magazines. There's Scholastic News. That made the cover story, so. Well, I'm glad you started with this because that was actually one of our questions that you've already answered. Someone wanted to know about Explorer because they were seeing it on yep. the screen. And the question was, is it a federated search engine that allows you to search multiple databases? Yes. Yes. And then, and I'm not even sure if it does this, if so, are there limiters to the number of databases you can search? Can you even control the, they, that, actually? They're preset by us. Okay, so it's a preset. Okay. Actually, we own and preset by EBSCO. It's preset by that. EBSCO. It's so, not preset. So I mean, we, yeah. have, we have a list of databases that we that they give us that we can include in it okay. and then we can choose from those which ones we want in this you can't pick and choose I don't want to search these no. databases and we have included everything yeah, yeah. so okay. cool. we, we that's, we've given that's you possible, all, yes. everything that is so allows us yes to and on our help pages we I'm assuming we spell out which databases are yes it does so I'm gonna go ahead and jump back to the page again and I do want to show you then this is the Explora the public library edition as EBSCO calls it um, you can see the graphics are a little more adult looking I like dinosaurs though I do too <laughs> now this database when you search Explora you are searching across the master file complete that I showed you earlier you are also searching across primary search um, there's also a biography reference center Consumer Health Complete, Legal Information Reference Center, and again, this is going to have those topical overviews that I just showed you in that my search for alligators. So I'm going to go ahead and browse. Let's go ahead and go to, let's look at some of the current events. And I'm going to go into Amazon, Amazon deforestation. Uh, deforestation. I can't say deforestation. it. There we go. Good thing I'm done talking almost. <laughs> So again, you can see here, uh, you know, we have that topic overview. Again, a, a variety of different resources, again, being limited to full text. And you can see here, again, we have academic journals, magazine, books, news, etc. So. Do you want to use the videos? Um, on the advanced search screen here, you can see um, there are some limiters that do apply specifically to some of the different databases, but I will let you explore that on your own some more. When you have time, and as Susan mentioned, if you click on the little question marks here, it will tell you everything that's included in those two Explorer interfaces. So I think that's all we wanted to cover and show on the databases. I will turn it back over to Deborah. And there were a couple questions, at least a couple questions. Well, yeah, there was the Explorer in. one, and then the other question, okay. which is specific to a database, but I think might apply to other ones too. Mm -hmm. um, someone says, um, our library currently subscribes to consumerreports.org via EBSCO. Since Master File Complete includes Consumer Reports magazines, can I cancel my standalone subscription to consumerreports.org? Or is the content between the two products unique enough that I should maintain my standalone subscription? I think we'd had that question before, and the answer was that the ConsumerReports.org subscription includes a lot of additional content. More than what's in here. It okay. includes more than just the online version of the print publication. So again, mm -hmm. it's going to be a judgment call on the part of the library, mm -hmm. but it's not. A, there is more in the subscription database than just the full text magazine article. So it might be something where you'd have to look and see what it says is included, what yours has, figure out what people might be trying to use and see if mm -hmm. you could save some by canceling yours now and going with this one instead. Kind of like what you do with any database yeah. decision, I think. Yeah. It's not a one to one yeah. sort of situation. Okay. That's the only other question that we actually have. If anyone does have any questions, last minute you want to get in, in the last few minutes we're here, type it in quick. <laughs> Otherwise, of course, you could ask and contact you guys at any time. <laughs> yes, you can contact us at any time. And as we said, um, here later this morning, or 
within the next couple hours, we will be sending out the email that gives you the link to this preview page and the password. So you can get in and play with the databases yourself. Okay, are we done? We're done. All right. Yeah. We just have some thank yous coming in. It looks like nobody else had any urgent uh, questions at the moment. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, guys. I'll take them out. Um, thank you very much, Alana, Susan, and Deborah, for taking us through this. I've been, you know, let's see. It's been a, a busy time in the last few months or so figuring this out. Maybe a stressful time <laughs> for people here figuring out what works, what's not, what's in there. Um, so, yeah, people are very excited to try it out. Thank you. Very informative, very informative. So, yeah, um, look for that chess stuff so that you guys can... Uh, Check it out yourself and start playing with what's in there. All right. So that will wrap it up for this week's uh, Encompass Live. Um, it's being recorded. So um, also maybe later today the recording will be available, available. So if you want to watch it again or you need to share it with a colleague who wasn't able to join us this morning, you'll be able to do that, send the um, recording off to people. Um, the recording will be available here on our website, as they always are, under our archived Encompass Live sessions, which is right below our upcoming sessions. So it'll be added here, and I will send an email out to everyone letting you know and announce it on our mailing lists. So thank you very much for attending, everyone. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is cataloging, a very popular topic always on Encompass Live whenever we have anything cataloging related. Um, Metadata Manipulations is the title, using Mark Edit and Open Refine to enhance technical services workflows, something I know absolutely nothing about, <laughs> uh, not being a cataloger it, at all. Deborah might understand this, top mm -hmm. the title. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but Emily Nemsikant, who up until last week was the cataloging librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, she is now, as of Monday, as you see here, the Head of Cataloging and Resource Management at the Schmidt Law Library at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, so elsewhere in town. She will be on the show with us talking about these cool cataloging things that you can use to help in, um, your workflow. So uh, definitely sign up for that. Join us for our next week's show. Um, this, this mouse is a little jumpy. Do we need a new battery? Uh, all right, so... Um, also, if you are a big Facebook user, there we go, um, Encompass Live is also on Facebook. Go ahead and like us there. You'll see announcements of when new shows are coming, when um, recordings are available. Here, as you can see, our top um, thing I just posted up this morning, a reminder to log in on the fly for today's show. So if you are big on Facebook, definitely go ahead and like us over there to keep up with what you're doing, what we're doing. <laughs> Other than that, that will wrap it up for this morning. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.